Welcome to the next episode of Chronic Briefs. Yes, it's time for another news episode, but before we begin, as always, if you like Chronic Briefs, if you enjoy what we do, please give us a like, a share, a subscribe, and help us to get the message out about chronic illness and disability. So, like usual, we start with some news about Chronic Briefs in general, or in this case, myself. Yeah, as the host, I get a certain level of leeway to talk about my wonderful self and my projects. <laughs> also, I'm the main writer and producer and editor. It's a lonely life. Anyway, we are now also making videos, in case you haven't heard, for CanIPlayThat.com. Yeah, Can I Play That is a wonderful and magical place where we take games and peripherals and test how accessible they are for those of us who need a little, you know, need a little extra when it comes to gaming. As you probably know, gaming is about the only thing I know more about than chronic illness and disability, as it's been my go-to escape since I was young, like many of you. It's not like I could grab a basketball and go out and shoot some hoopers, right? Hoopers? Hoop, hoop, hoopers? That's the saying? Hoop, hoops! Oops! <laughs> it's hoops. Anyway, the point is, keep an eye out on all our social media for the new Can I Play That videos, and the first one is out now, so check it out. Now, though, without further ado, it's time for the Chronic Briefs News Network to go back on the air. I'm your host, Payne Daly, <laughs> and here's the chronic illness news you can use. We'll start, as we always do, with some rheumatoid arthritis news because, as I've said many, many times before, I'm biased towards it because I have it. So, too bad. It seems that for patients with RA, higher disease activity may be associated with a greater risk for diabetes. <sighs> According to a study published in the Annals of the Rheumatic Disease, adults with no history of diabetes with RA who were selected from the Veterans Affairs Rheumatoid Arthritis Registry were screened and measured for diabetic activity and it was discovered that those patients whose RA was more active presented with a higher preponderance of diabetes mellitus. In fact, Patients who had a very high level of C-reactive protein, which is a test that sometimes shows rheumatoid activity, they were actually associated with a two-fold increase in risk for diabetes. Well, isn't that wonderful? Another comorbidity that can be caused by RA. I mean, we already have heart disease, lung issues, osteoporosis, fatigue, eye issues, hairy elbows, death, lymphoma, dental problems, death again, costochondritis, annoying friends, risk of infection, being cracked for essential oil salesmen, pneumonia, smelly knees, death for a third time, and much, much more, as you can see. Now, we have to worry about diabetes too, my God! I'm not even mentioning the fact that sometimes the only thing you have to look forward to on those awful days is a heaping bowl of sugar. I mean, not like, not like an actual bowl of sugar, obviously. I'm not a bear. <laughs> but you know, after a day of pain, sometimes you just want to sit in your bed and say, Where are me lucky charms? Red syringes, orange pills, yellow heating pads, and purple horseshoe pillows. Yeah, you know, it's the little things that make living with RA that much easier. And here's yet another one we have to worry about. Where's that stupid tricks rabbit when you need him? Okay, next. You know here we are big advocates of pain management and hate the current war being waged against pain patients in this country. We are being single-handedly blamed for the opioid crisis and so many people are being hurt unnecessarily. I go on Facebook every day and I see patients in pain from around the country saying things like, they told me I have to go off my pain medicine. I didn't do anything wrong. What am I going to do? And it breaks your heart which is why a study like this next one is dangerous. A new study from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry says that a low dose of a drug called naltrexone is a good option for patients with tooth pain and chronic pain, and chronic pain. The study was led by Elizabeth Hatfield, a clinical lecturer from the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery and Hospital Dentistry, who said, we found a reduction in pain intensity and improvement in quality of life and a reduction in opioid use, which is what they really want, for patients with chronic pain. Now, let me break this down for you in case you missed it. A bunch of dentistry people who work on the mouth have now released a study that claims this medicine is good for chronic pain. Pray tell, what does a dentist know about chronic pain sufferers like people who have RA? 
You know, when people ask me what hurts today, I've had a million different answers to that question over the years. Knees, elbows, ankles, shoulders, wrists, collarbones, toes, fingers, back, ribs, shins, heel, neck, coccyx, hip, and even one time, the good old family jewels. Yeah, that was an alarming day. But you know what I've never given as an answer to the question of what's hurting today? <laughs> you guessed it, my tooth. So what the hell does a dentist know about treating the chronic pain of arthritis? What, 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 what? The correct answer is nothing. So you know what dentists? Keep your studies and your meds where they belong, in your mouth and out of the rest of my body. The next story is a weird one. And not our regular run-of-the-mill type weird, but weird even for us. In a review article published in the eLife Journal, there is growing evidence to suggest that losing some of the helminth parasites that live relatively harmlessly in our bodies may contribute to faster aging and age-related inflammation. Now, here's the weird part. You thought that was it, but it gets worse. A restorative treatment is being considered that will reintroduce the parasites back into the body. Yeah, yeah. Supposedly, these worms help create a decline in allergic and autoimmune inflammatory disorders, including, but not limited to, heart disease, dementia, cancer, COPD, osteoporosis, age-related eye problems, and most recently, severity of COVID symptoms. Yeah, looks like our dogs had it right all along. Got osteoporosis? Well, I've got a little guy who'll fit right into those holes in them bones. Heart disease? Look no further. I've got a slimy little guy who's got his heart set on you. Eye issues? Well, I know a squiggly little guy who'll worm his way into your... <laughs> I can't even say it. The theory is that changes in your gut where these worms live cause what they are now calling inflammaging, the inflammation due to aging. But until now, no one has really studied the ecosystem that includes organisms like helmet parasites, flukes, tapeworms, and nematodes. David Gems, professor of biogerontology and research director at the UCL Institute of Healthy Aging, says that these worms could be used to treat both known inflammatory disorders and reversing inflammation. Oh, if the cure for RA turns out to be nematodes, then I'm a nematodally not going to get it. Oh. Finally today, a new study by a Canadian research team and London researchers from Lawson Health Research Institute and Western University, not to be confused with Eastern University, Total Party Institute, they've compared the walking patterns and brain function of 500 study participants and discovered a relationship between the way people walk and the type of cognitive decline they might suffer. This is so strange, right? The study, published in Alzheimer's and Dementia, the Journal of the Alzheimer's Association, and led by Dr. Manuel Montero Odesso, says that specifically they can see which patients will probably end up with early onset dementia simply by analyzing the person's gait. Yeah, their gait. That's gait as in G-A-I-T. Yeah, not gait, G-A-T-E, yeah. Even over the internet I hear some of you scratching your heads like, uh, what the hell does the entrance to his backyard have to do with Alzheimer's? Huh? Well, I guess Fred next door is doomed with his garbage fence. Yeah, yeah, it's gait, G-A-I-T. It seems that small variations in the way that someone moves, in the, in the way that they're able to move their legs, can be used as a warning sign or an early predictor, if you will, of neurological issues, which, I mean, I guess it makes sense if you think about it. I mean, walking does take coordination and a lot of times is one of the first things to go when diseases affect the nerves. It's actually, it's actually no wonder that they can tell what's in store simply by looking at someone walk. Heck, imagine if they tried to diagnose me by the way I walked. Oh boy. Uh, yes, I believe he's going to suffer from a very serious case of Refusicus infernius, or as it's more commonly known, dumpster on fire disease. <laughs> yeah. So that's it for this edition of CBNN, the Chronic Briefs News Network. I'm your host, Payne Daly, and as always, we bring you the chronic illness news that you need when no one else will. Remember, folks, if you laughed, if you learned, if you got worms, please give us a like, a subscribe, a share, and help us get our message out. In the meantime, be kind, rewind, keep on keeping on, and we'll talk soon. Oh, the worms, the worms. I can feel them wriggling and jiggling inside me. Ooh.